Without further ado, let me introduce Pat Ruff. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is so awesome. Um, it's really wonderful to be back in Kalamazoo. Uh, my husband, Bill Hanneman, and I um, retired to Cleveland a few years ago, so um, after living here for 27 years, so uh, it's great to be back. Um, I'm a writer by trade, but most of my previous books uh, have been nonfiction for preschoolers. Um, so this book is a little different from writing about trucks and baby animals and um, I fell into it pretty accidentally. So my friend uh, and co-author D.A. Dirks is not here today. They've moved back to their hometown of Calgary, Alberta to teach at Mount Royal University. But D.A. and I uh, met when we were both working uh, here uh, on degrees in medieval studies at Western and I was teaching Latin up there. DA was also the LGBTQ coordinator at Western, and at that time I was on the board of the Planned Parenthood affiliate here. So, in 2002, Planned Parenthood held a service at First Presbyterian downtown to commemorate the Roe versus Wade decision that made abortion legal nationwide. And in the printed program that day, I saw a story about um, a Presbyterian minister, Bob Hare, who had just won an award from uh, Planned Parenthood for his work with a group called the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion. In 1969, the state of Massachusetts, or Commonwealth I guess it is, had charged him in criminal court for referring a woman to a doctor for safe abortion. The story surprised me because I'm old enough to remember 1969. Uh, I'd been involved with Planned Parenthood for a long time, and I'm even a Presbyterian, but I'd never heard of Bob Hare or of the group. So afterwards, I asked the then minister at First Presbyterian, Dave Van Arsdale, whether he'd heard of the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion before, and he said, oh yes, my father, was a Baptist minister in a tiny town in upstate New York, and he was a member of the group. And I suddenly realized he, he's implying it was a big group, like not just New York City people, it was across the country. So then I was even more baffled, but also fascinated. So my friend DA had taught courses on feminist history, so I showed DA this program, and um, DA hadn't heard of the group. So we tried to learn more, but there wasn't that much written about it. So we just resolved that we would try to track down any living members of the group that we could find and at least record an interview with them and so that it would be down someplace as at least as a little oral history. Even if it was something a staple, a bunch of pages stapled together, that would be enough to at least get it on get it get it written down. Uh, because time was passing and it was a story that really shouldn't die with the participants, we also assumed there were no paper, there was no paper record of the group because they must have been quite clandestine. So we started doing interview reviews in our spare time and whenever we traveled. Um, and Mark Pulowski, who was another Presbyterian minister who was CEO of Planned Parenthood here at the time, put us on to ministers that he knew and rabbis that he knew that had been part of the group. Over 15 years, we talked with more than 75 uh, clergy counselors uh, that were part of the group, and eventually we did find some paper archives. And of course, in that 15 years, the subject also went from being what we thought would just be an interesting footnote to history to being extremely pertinent. So I'm going to go back a little bit and uh, give you a little background on what was going on in the 1960s, since there are some young people here who might not remember. In the early 60s, um, abortion was regulated state by state, and by regulated I mean pretty much forbidden everywhere. Um, it was illegal or inaccessible, at least, for most women. Most wealthy women could, women could find a private doctor to do an abortion for them in their office. Uh, otherwise, if you had the means, you could uh, apply to a hospital committee for approval to get an abortion. And uh, the committee of doctors, usually all male doctors, 
um, would uh, they uh, you'd have to go before them and um, make the case that uh, her that uh, the person's life was endangered by the pregnancy or they were suicidal. So some women actually studied psychology textbooks so they'd know what to say to the committee. Um, and often the approval hinged on multiple medical examinations, which would be both expensive and take a long time. So even if the pro uh, procedure was approved, it would involve overnight or longer at the, uh, at the hospital, which also was expensive and might include agreeing to being sterilized. Sterilization, sometimes involuntary, was most common for women of color. Uh, women who didn't have the means to go through all that big process found, uh, found their um, abortions elsewhere, from midwives, especially in the South, from sketchy practitioners, usually not doctors, um, uh, operating illegally, sometimes under filthy, condition, under filthy conditions or in scary locations. And sometimes women were sexually assaulted when they, when they went to those practitioners. Um, or uh, women would attempt self-abortion using a horrifying variety of methods from knitting needles to drain cleaner. Um, the result of all these alternate methods was a tremendous number of deaths from botched abortions. Officially, about 5,000 a year in the US in the early 60s, but certainly many, probably most abortions were not recorded as such. It would be recorded as some, something else. Um, botched abortions accounted for half of all childbearing deaths in New York City. So at the time, a majority of OBGYN doctors supported liberalizing the abortion laws. Uh, in 1959, the American Law Institute recommended model legislation that would make abortion legal for reasons of physical or mental health of the woman, risk of serious birth defect, or for rape or incest. Soon after that, um, no, <laughs> no more. Uh, abortion came into the news because of the drug thalidomide, a European drug that caused serious uh, fetal abnormalities. Uh, in 1962, an American woman who had taken the drug, Sherry Chesson Finkbein, uh, sought an abortion and went public to try to warn other women about the drug uh, and not to take it during pregnancy. But the case set off a media frenzy and her agreed upon uh, um, uh, abortion at a hospital in Arizona was now refused and she had to go to Sweden to get her abortion. Another event hit the news in 1965, a rubella epidemic. Rubella during pregnancy can cause serious problems for the fetus, blindness, deafness, heart defects, and other disabilities. So there was a discussion of that and widespread popular uh, support for abortion in cases like that. About that time, study groups and reform organizations began to organize to change the state abortion laws. These groups were often based at universities and included doctors, academics, and clergy. Uh, and there was a large such group, for example, in Michigan. Uh, it was a combined uh, U of M and Michigan State group that uh, tried to lobby for uh, law reform here. Uh, these groups' efforts to liberalize the laws were actually centered on doctors' rights to practice as they wanted to, not not actually on women's rights. Um, so they began to lobby in state legislatures to reform the law, and usually based on this uh, American Law Institute uh, model legislation. So in the mid-1960s in New York City, about this time, an ecumenical group of liberal clergy used to meet at Washington Square Methodist Church in Greenwich Village to discuss issues of social justice. And that church now is made into condos, but it's right there by Washington Square. Almost all of the group's members were men because uh, at the time, of course, most ordained people were men. Uh, women did go to seminary, but then they would usually become ministers of education or music. Very few of them were, uh, were uh, parish ministers. Only a few of the clergy had already had experience with abortion counseling. 
Reverend Howard Moody of Judson Memorial Church, which is right nearby on Washington Square, an American Baptist, had his first such experience in 1957. He went with a woman who was tr seeking an abortion and she was scared to go by herself. And they went to a house in New Jersey uh, when, the woman, when the woman who answered the door saw that a man was there, she slammed the door in their face. Um, so um, for most of the, he, he did eventually find her a doctor and continued to make occasional referrals. Uh, and you'll see Moody, Moody had been a, um, he's a, a, he was a very charming man. He had been a Marine during World War II and he kept his crew cut his whole life long and he had a Texas drawl um, and he, uh, he was, he was just a, a sweet man. He would go to protests and he could um, linger by where the police were, find out what they were planning to do uh, because they would never suspect that he was a liberal guy and go back and tell the protesters what was going on. Anyway, uh, in New, it, it, for most of the group, they didn't, they didn't have any experience with, um, with abortion referral. In New York State in 1966, there was a push to reform the state abortion law. At that time, it was mostly Republicans who, were call, who um, called for deregulating abortion um, on the basis that doctors should be allowed to practice as they saw fit without regulation. A bill was introduced in the New York State Legislature, but it failed. In early 1967, there was another bill that uh, the clergy group hoped would pass. When it too failed, they decided they needed to act. The author Larry Later, who later, later founded NARAL, had written a book in 1966 called Abortion. It was excerpted in, of all things, Reader's Digest <laughs> and widely read. As a result, Later received a constant stream of letters and phone calls from women wanting re um, referrals to doctors for abortion. He did give many referrals, but it was too much for one person. Later knew Moody and others in the clergy group, and he pushed them to start offering abortion referrals. So the clergy were willing, but they wanted first to educate themselves. They met with doctors so they could learn how an abortion was done, with women who had had abortions to learn about the experience, and with lawyers from the New York Civil Liberties Union, including board member Ephraim London, for legal advice. The rules they set were refer out of state to confused jurisdictions, counsel in person only, not by phone or letter. Um, the counselors had to be clergy because the status would be some protection for them, uh, the confidentiality of, uh, of the clergy. Um, they, he, they did not want them to appear clandestine or underground in any way. They wanted them to, um, to do this on the basis that it was part of their ordinary, um, their ordinary pastoral work. And they would refer to licensed physicians who had been vetted by women. That brings us to one of our heroes, Arlene Carmen. Arlene was a longtime activist who became the administrator at Judson Church in 1967. At the clergy consultation, as the clergy consultation service began its work, she also became the administrator and much more for the group. When the, when the clergy consultation service began, Ephraim London, the group's volunteer attorney, advised the clergy to counsel women to make ref and make referrals, but never to have any communication with the doctors who were performing the abortions. Arlene Carmen took on the job of maintaining connections with doctors from checking on their credentials offices and bedside manner to arranging how women were to contact them to negotiating prices. She would do no counseling herself. With this strict division of labor, they hoped, conspiracy among the clergy, client, and abortion provider would be difficult to prove. Carmen headed a women's committee to find and evaluate doctors. She and others took tremendous personal risks to ensure that the doctors used by the clergy consultation service were capable practitioners and respectful to patients. <clears throat> in 
They visited them in person, using, usually posing as pregnant women in search of an abortion. When Carmen posed as a potential patient, she was sometimes in the examining room on a table with her feet in stirrups before she revealed her real mission and proffered a letter from the clergy. <laughs> you can just imagine the surprised doctors. Um, she later told interviewer Ellen Chesler, I went through all the steps short of having an actual abortion before I would make it clear that I was not there for that purpose. <coughs> Often I never got that far because something about the situation was so appalling. I knew immediately that it was not a situation I thought we could refer women to. If an office was very filthy, for example, or if the doctor was very crude, unpleasant, God knows what. In fact, sometimes Carmen dropped a doctor from the list after the first phone call. She later recalled, you'd be told, meet me at such and such a parking lot at such and such a time at such and such a place. Who is the doctor? Where is the office? Don't worry about it. As Carmen recalled to Chesler, she and the other women who assessed the doctors looked for certain things. The doctor had to be a licensed physician, but not necessarily a gynecologist. Experience providing abortion care was more important than the specialist credential. They looked for doctors who did the procedure as a sideline in their own communities where they practiced openly. They felt strongly that the procedure should be done in an office, or at least uh, in a professional medical atmosphere, not in a motel room. Although they did later, um, some of the groups did refer to doctors who practiced out of hotel rooms. Um, they also considered the doctor's manner and personality in dealing with patients. Quote, whether it was punitive and judgmental, or whether they were just treated as patients are most often treated. For at least the first year, Carmen said, cost was not a primary consideration, although that came to be a topic for negotiation as the CCS, that's the Clergy Consultation Service, realized how valuable their referrals were to the physician. Finally, the procedure had to be a dilation and curatage, DNC, done under either local or no anesthetic. Carmen said, quote, although we understood that a woman undergoing the procedure without an anesthetic was going to experience more pain, it was felt that she would be medically safer than she would be having a general anesthetic as in an office setting, especially in an illegal kind of thing, where if something were going to go wrong, uh, the, the doctor would really be in a difficult position. Uh, unquote, and her life could be jeopardized. As they dealt with more dr doctors, CCS coordinators realized that the experience was much more important than pr prestigious credentials. Doctors who had done many abortions had a lower complication rate. As the, uh, as the clergy group organized and prepared themselves, the author Larry Later, that was the guy who wrote the book on abortion, pushed them to go public. Founding member uh, Reverend Robert Pierce, a UCC minister, remembered, he used to shame us. That's the only way of saying it. Why aren't you bastards doing something? <laughs> he was very vocal, very in your face. In fact, later gave them a final push by announcing the group's existence in, pub in a public lecture before they were ready. And that's this article on the right. It just remained for the group to decide on a name. Some of the group wanted to use the less controversial term, problem pregnancies, in their title, mainly for a bit of legal protection. Others, including later Schaaf and Reverend Jesse Lyons, argued for speaking plainly and using the term abortion. Later, whose 1966 book, subsequent speaking engagements and public offer to refer women for abortions had been an effort to bring the issue out of the shadows and into the national debate, argued that, quote, the impact of the service depended on, on open and total commitment, unquote. The clergy also had a practical fear that they, if they did not use the word abortion, the women who most needed them would not find them. 
the plain speakers won out and they decided on the name Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion, deliberately choosing to serve women more effectively over making their own public relations task easier. Quote, Abor abortion is a loaded, fearsome word, but we decided we didn't want to chicken out on it, Moody recalled. In an address at a 40th anniversary celebration for the CCS, Moody said, it was important to use the word abortion. At that time, it was not used in public discourse. The aim was to normalize that word. And in fact, the, um, the UCC minister in Los Angeles who started that group there um, said he had never heard the word before. Um, so finally, the group appointed Reverend Howard Moody as spokesperson for the group and wrote a statement of purpose. It began, the present abortion laws require over a million women in the United States each year to seek illegal abortions, which often cause severe mental anguish, physical suffering, and unnecessary death of women. These laws also com compel the birth of unwanted, unloved, and often deformed children. Yet a truly humane society is one in which the birth of a child is an occasion for genuine celebration, not the imposition of a penalty or punishment up on the mother. These laws brand as criminal, as criminal wives and mothers who are often driven as helpless victims to desperate acts. The clergy pledge to educate the public about the problem and advocate for legal reform in New York State and nationally. In the meantime, the statement continued, women are being driven alone and afraid into the underworld of criminality or the dangerous practice of self-induced abortion. The clergy ended by stating their intention. Therefore, believing as clergymen that there are higher laws and moral obligations transcending legal codes, we believe that it is our pastoral responsibility and religious duty to give aid and assistance to all women with problem pregnancies. To that end, we are establishing a clergyman's consultation service on abortion, which will include referral to the best available medical advice and aid to women in need. In need. Facing antiquated abortion laws, little hope for reform, and unknown legal repercussions, the service was ready to launch. So from the very first days, um, the, women, uh, the group was, uh, let's see. Oh, I should say. Uh, on Monday, so, so on Monday, May 22nd, 1969, a story appeared in the New York Times. They had decided that they wanted to retain control of how the story came out. So Howard Moody was elected spokesman and he gave an interview to a reporter from the New York Times. And it appeared, that first little bit, appears on the front page that day. And this was the inside part that listed 21 ministers and rabbis and their congregations and openly all their contact information um, that would offer abortion referral. They set up a, um, they set up a, a telephone answering machine, if you remember such things, in Judson Church, uh, which was Howard Moody's church uh, in New York. Um, and it had an outgoing message only. So women would call the, the, um, the number, and every week there would be a message, a new message, telling two or three uh, clergy persons who would be on call that week and how to reach them, their, tel their office telephone numbers usually. And women could decide either on the basis of where they were located or by their religion or whatever they wanted. Um, who to call and make the call themselves and make an appointment to see to see the uh, to see the clergy person. So uh, at first, of course, the clergy didn't know what to expect. As far as they were concerned, this could come out and the police would be at their door the next morning. But uh, they didn't, uh, and they did not expect to receive the deluge of calls that they did. They got a lot, including from all across the country. So, and, and in large numbers. Because they were committed to counseling only in person, 
the, um, they couldn't help most women from out of state, although women did uh, come all the way from all over the country just to have in-person counseling and, uh, and get a referral. Um, so clearly the, the service was needed everywhere and the New York City um, group uh, members reached out to clergy they knew in other states. Reverend Howard Moody, for example, reached out to fellow Baptists in Philadelphia and Chicago. Um, and then they recruited like-minded clergy uh, in their area. Often um, they had connections through their previous civil rights work, anti-war work, or poverty work. Um, the same clergy who were standing up for those issues were usually the ones who were willing to stand up for this one. In other cases, clergy from out of state heard of the group and called Moody themselves to find out how they could start a group in their state. Um, Reverend Hugh Anwell, and so he now uses the uh, Welsh spelling of his name because he's a Welshman, a UCC minister, and Liz Canfield, who was an Austrian immigrant uh, who had done some uh, family planning work and worked for the free clinic in Los Angeles. Uh, they were part of one of these, um, Los, uh, to, in Los Angeles, they were part of one of these university-based groups at UCLA that included doctors, ministers, and other people. They contacted Moody, and um, they vi then visited New York for a training. Uh, so did Reverend Chick Strout, who was a Methodist minister in New Jersey. Moody and Arlene Carmen often traveled around the country to train uh, groups in other states. Most mainline denominations were uh, represented, represented uh, in about this order as far as the names that we know and can assign a, um, a denomination to. Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Episcopalian, UCC, Unitarian, Lutheran, Reformed Jewish, and then there were many others, almost any denomination you can name. Um, they, the others even included some Roman Catholic priests and nuns. Generally, they didn't do the referrals themselves, but were willing to be on hand to counsel women uh, after their abortion, if, if Catholic women had uh, doubts or any problems. From her office at Judson Church, Arlene Carmen administered the national group with an iron hand, I may say. The clergy did not want to cross her, and neither did the doctors. She was, she, she, she could be quite commanding, apparently. And apparently, in person, everybody who actually knew her said she was a very retiring, quite quiet person. But on behalf of women, she was a, a staunch advocate. Uh, she managed the referral list of, of the doctors that had been approved, and she also kept a, a negative list of doctors that were. She, she called them bad news. Uh, she also made sure the clergy counselors followed the guidelines set by the group and, yeah, don't cross her. Um, how many counselors were probably part of the network? Uh, Arlene Carmen gave the number 3,000, and we have no reason to doubt that figure. We've managed to track down the names of more than half that many, and we're still, we're still finding people all the time. Um, Eventually, not all the counselors were clergy counselors. Uh, some chapters recruited social workers, nurses, and other non-clergy counselors. Uh, and there were many of those in Michigan. The Michigan group had a lot of women who were, um, who were social workers and nurses. In Missouri, it was actually a nurse who started the clergy consultation service group. So it was truly a unique group because it was a group of men that was a feminist group. Um, it was, I mean, it was mostly men. Uh, they worked to return to women power over their own bodies. Later on, uh, in later years, when the New York State Legislature was writing the law that made abortion legal there, uh, and that happened in 1970. Uh, legislators asked Howard Moody if he thought there should be a requirement that women seek counseling from clergy or some other counselor before they could receive an abortion. He told them, absolutely not. 
uh, that the clergy had only involved themselves at all as a practical way, as a practical way around the existing law. The clergy felt strongly that the decision was entirely up to a patient in consultation with their doctor. Uh, the clergy consultation service, of course, was made up of mostly middle class white men, and which was in a profession that was very prestigious at the time. Um, and yet it was truly a radical group uh, because they concluded it wasn't enough to amend or reform the laws. Uh, they really needed, they really wanted the law to be repealed. Um, Howard Moody said, reform is the enemy of real social change. From a religious viewpoint, that made them prophetic. From a political viewpoint, they truly were radicals. The group was also a populist group because they served women of every socioeconomic status and race and religion with a special effort to make ab abortion affordable. We found that all kinds of women used the service. Some of the services kept very detailed um, statistics. And in most places, it was a, real, a true representative cross-section of, um, of the local population. Uh, the clergy consultation service tried to recruit a diverse group of counselors, including women, which, as I said, was a limited pool at that time. But of course, women counselors were much preferred by the women who were calling the service. Um, there was a woman minister uh, who was a Methodist uh, in that original group of ministers. She wasn't listed in the paper, but um, she was on their, on their referral um, rotation. And when she was on the referral rotation, she was overwhelmed. She had women lined up outside her door at her very sketchy apartment <laughs> building. Um, she was amazed. She was amazed by it. Uh, one Presbyterian woman was ordained in the morning, and in the afternoon, her um, her ch head of staff at her church uh, took her to a meeting of the clergy consultation service. Um, for clergy that, that very same afternoon. She got a standing ovation from all the men in the room. The group included some black clergy, but not many. We did hear there was a black clergyman in, uh, in the group here in Kalamazoo. Uh, there were several possible reasons for the small number of uh, black participants. Um, first, of, of course, in the early 20th century, family planning was promoted by, among others, uh, people in the eugenics movement, and uh, which openly sought to advance superior genes over inferior ones. And so that association lingered uh, in people's minds. There was uh, also, of course, the well-founded suspicion of uh, white medical establishment. Um, because, uh, you know, going back to Dr. Marion Sims, um, James Marion Sims' experimentation on enslaved women and children, and the Tuskegee experiments in which uh, promised treatments for syphilis uh, were withheld from black men, that was still going on until 1972. Um, and also the forced sterilization of black women, especially in the South. Um, so there's, you know, there's little doubt that there would be suspicion of the, of, uh, the medical establishment. Uh, during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, uh, these abuses became more public. And some black leaders, mostly young men, concluded that white controlled, um, uh, the white controlled system had a stake in suppressing the black population and called abortion and even contraception black genocide. Many women of color fought for access to birth control and contraception. Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman elected to the US Congress, and she ran for president in 1972. Chisholm wrote in 1970, after she became honorary Ch president of NARAL, that, quote, there is a deep and angry suspicion among many blacks that even birth control clinics are a plot by the white power structure to keep down the numbers of blacks. And this opinion is even more strongly held in, in, by some in regard to legalizing abortions. But I do not know any black or Puerto Rican women who feel that way. To la label family planning and legal abortion programs genocide is male rhetoric for male ears 
it falls flat to female listeners and to thoughtful male ones. Many women of color also fought for contraception and abortion rights, often combining the fight with that against sterilization to complete th their contention that they should have full reproductive control over their bodies to reproduce as well as not to. Um, so uh, Representative Chisholm, by the way, uh, while during the time she was both president of NARAL and was a representative, uh, used to get calls to her congressional office from women seeking abortions, and her staff would refer women to the clergy consultation service. But perhaps the most compelling reason that black clergy uh, may not have joined the CCS in great numbers is that most were still focused on civil rights uh, and poverty and jobs, all the things that are still going on. In any case, we weren't able to identify many of the uh, CCS clergy as black, and it's our great regret that we didn't have a chance to talk to a single black clergy uh, participant in the group. The day that cler the clergy announced their work on the front page of the New York Times, they were all half expecting that knock on the door from the police. Uh, pol but it didn't happen because the police and prosecutors were generally, um, they generally left the group alone because they realized that they were saving a lot of women's lives. They were the ones who dealt with finding women who had, had botched abortions and so on. In fact, many of the clergy we talked to could remember referring a family member or girlfriend of a police officer or judge. However, three counselors did get caught up in investigations of doctors, so the, the police were more likely to go after doctors that were sketchy. Um, and two of the clergy actually were charged with a crime for their work. So, next. Sorry. Um, so let's go back to, uh, to Bob Hare, whom I mentioned at the beginning, and I'm sorry I don't have a better picture of him than that. Uh, that was from uh, the 50th anniversary uh, celebration of the, of the group uh, in New York. Um, the head of the Cleveland chapter of the Clergy Consultation Service, Reverend Farley Wheelwright, uh, he was a Unitarian, had found a doctor in Massachusetts, Dr. Pierre Brunel. He was a Canadian doctor um, who had been practicing in Massachusetts, and he, received, he had received good reports from women. What Wheelwright didn't know was that Brunel had lost his license in Massachusetts and was being watched by police. So one night in April 1969, a Cleveland woman was starting the drive home from Dr. Brunel's office when she suffered severe cramps and stopped at a police station for help. The police questioned her and she told them everything, including that she had been referred by a member of the Cleveland Clergy Consultation Service. Wheelwright knew nothing of this police involvement um, until a couple of months later when they learned that Dr. Brunel had been arrested. By that time, police had already questioned some of the women whose names were found in Brunel's files, among them a woman who had been referred by Reverend Bob Hare. He was a Presbyterian minister. He had kind of a house church, like a kind of alternative house church uh, that moved around from place to place in Cleveland. Uh, let's see. So, Bob Hare, whom we did talk to. <clears throat> when Hare heard that the woman had already talked with the police, he sought an attorney. Jerry Messerman was already a well-known social justice and free speech lawyer. Uh, as Hare remembered it, Messerman told him not to worry, that Brunette, Brunel was in trouble, but that the woman happened to learn of him through hair was ancillary and probably of no interest at all to a prosecutor. That evaluation proved to be optimistic. At 7 o'clock the next morning, Hare recalled, his home phone rang. It was the Associated Press asking, Will you confirm for us that you've been criminally indicted in the state of Massachusetts yesterday? Uh, this, is, this is Hare talking. I said, what? I'd not heard from any court. I'd, I could hear the ticker tapes going in the newsroom in the background. He said, well, it's on the wire service, you and Dr. P v Pierre Victor Brunel. Do you know Dr. Brunel? I said, no, literally, I didn't know him. 
the, the reporter told Hare that the wire service story said that Hare and Burnell had been indicted on a unit indictment. In other words, the two men had been indicted as one for the same crime, performing an abortion, with Hare aiding and abetting. Hare called Messerman, who was both surprised and dismayed. As he recalled, Messerman told him, we're in very deep trouble. A unit indictment is rare. We have a big choice to make fairly quickly. If we just let them do it, you're going to get arrested by Ohio State Police on behalf of Massachusetts. And they're, prob they're probably out there looking for you now. So watch your step. Sure enough, wherever Hare went that day, people told him that police had been looking for him. <laughs> Hare considered the alternatives. Fight extradition to Massachusetts, which would be expensive and not necessarily successful. Wait for police to arrive, possibly at his home, to handcuff him and haul him off to jail, probably subject to a great deal of press coverage. Or, as he decided to do, appear in, Mass in court in Massachusetts voluntarily. So Hare and Messerman flew to, to Boston and appeared before a judge in Middlesex County, Hare in a dark suit and clerical collar. So uh, eventually, uh, after a lot of haranguing, the unit indictment was dismissed. In other words, they, would, uh, they charged him separately from uh, the doctor. And Brunel was convicted. Hare's, he went to jail, too. Uh, Hare's charge, charges were dismissed in, um, in spring of 1970. But the prosecutor appealed this dismissal, which is almost unheard of, and eventually re-indicted him. The legal case dragged on and on until, at last, in early 1973, this, this had happened in 1969, recall, um, the Roe v. Wade decision finally made the whole thing moot, and the charges, you know, he didn't hear anything more about it. So the clergy, a similar thing happened to a, to a rabbi in, um, a, a rabbi in Chicago who was charged uh, with referring a woman to a doctor in uh, Detroit. A uh, similar thing uh, was he was he was under threat of prosecution until he um, until Roe versus Wade happened. So the clergy consultation service made hundreds uh, hundreds of thousands of abortion referrals from 1967 to 1973. It didn't take them long to realize that their referrals were valuable to doctors. They began to negotiate lower prices and set strict conditions for the doctors. They, be they became a real consumer advocacy group. And they, uh, proved that they proved that outpatient abortion was safe. Until that time, um, a legal therapeutic abortion would have to be performed in the hospital uh, and involved an overnight or longer stay. So, um, but of all the hundreds of thousands of abortions which they, for which they made the referral, there was not a single death, and they were all outpatient abortions. When New York State legalized abortion in 1970, the Clergy Consultation Service invited a doctor that they'd been using to come to New York and open an outpatient abortion clinic. Dr. Hale Harvey, who I couldn't find a picture of, um, had received glowing reports from his patients. He was respectful and caring, and provided many thoughtful niceties. For example, he would put um, pot holders on the stirrups so they wouldn't feel cold to women's feet. Um, when he and his associate, Barbara Pyle, uh, set up the clinic in rented offices in New York City, they put up art and generally tried to make it feel kind of homey. Um, and that was an innovative idea at the time. That most clinics of any kind were very sterile places, and, uh, and abortion clinics and other clinics since then have followed, that, uh, have followed that model to try to make it seem a little less cold and uh, austere. The clinic, Women's Services, opened on July 1st, 1970, the day the new law took effect in New York State. In 1972, the clinic's then medical director was, uh, by that time, Dr. Bernard Nathanson, 
Uh, now, that is a name that some of you might recognize who are old enough because he later became a vigorous anti-abortion activist. Uh, and he narrated the film Silent Scream. But in 1972, he was the director of Women's Services and he published a study in the New, York, New England Journal of Medicine showing the safety of 26,000 outpatient abortions performed at the clinic. Today, not only abortion, but many, many surgical uh, procedures are done on, on an outpatient clinic basis. And uh, that was, uh, you know, things like knee surgeries, you take it for granted now, gallbladder surgery, vasectomies. Um, that outpatient um, revolution was really um, led by uh, this, uh, this out outpatient abortion clinics. Um, the New England Journal study also came out just a few months before the Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman uh, was researching and writing the Roe v. Wade decision. Uh, he went to the Mayo Clinic Library to do that research because uh, he had been a he had been a legal counsel for for um, for the Mayo Clinic previously, and we can't help thinking that he must have taken that uh, study into consideration when he wrote the decision. So the CCS was also an advocacy group, and they were uniquely placed to offer statistics on. Um, mil on thousands of, case of cases. They testified at lots of state legislature hearings. Um, and their clergy status allowed them to counterbalance the Roman Catholic uh, clergy, who were really the most vocal uh, opponents of abortion law reform at the time. Um, they, they were really the only, uh, the only people that were uh, protesting uh, abortion. Um, at, of course, there was a problem with this. Uh, the CCS um, uh, clergy were, were heard as a t authoritative because, uh, not only because they had the statistics, but also because they were white men with you know, a, a certain privilege, uh, a pr privilege standing. Women, including organized feminist groups, were often excluded from, or um, excluded from these hearings or silenced, as unfortunately that we still see that happening. Um, nonetheless, the the clergy used their privilege to uh, tell the stories of women who were not um, who were not able to um, to tell their own stories because of the tremendous stigma attached to abortion. So um, the legacies of the, of the clergy consultation service, um, technically the, the service dismanded, uh, dismantled uh, state by state as it became, as abortion became legally state by state. Um, but many of the uh, clergy continued to work for reproductive justice. So next one. Uh, in 1970, when abortion was, re was legalized in, in New York State, um, uh, he, Howard Moody and Arlene Carmen and others started a um, group that would monitor the uh, availability of abortions in New York State city hospitals, which in fact were completely uh, unprepared for the huge uh, uh, influx of people who would be demanding abortions. Uh, they also um, fought against uh, uh, for-profit uh, re uh, referral, referral services around the country. Those were uh, services that would take fees and kickbacks for uh, making referrals, which would be, which would, you know, the information was available for free. Um, but they would they would uh, they would they would take they would take f f uh, kickbacks to refer them to particular um, clinics, uh, and the clergy consultation service uh, joined with Planned Parenthood and other uh, groups to um, to make sure that the referrals were free. Uh, and then next slide after the Roe versus Wade decision. Um, some of the clergy consultation service um, uh, clergy 
uh, pressured, pressured uh, hospitals uh, and, and Planned Parenthood centers to, uh, to offer abortion care. Many joined Planned Parenthood's uh, local and uh, national clergy advisory boards. And in many locations, including here in Kalamazoo, um, uh, Planned Parenthood had clergy, consul had clergy um, volunteers available to counsel women before and after their abortions and during recovery, um, or simply to be with them during that time. The religious coalition of uh, uh, the religious coalition on a reproductive choice (RCRC) was formed to uh, continue the clergy consultation service um, uh, advocacy work and provide resources to women, clinics, and clergy, and other um, clergy, uh, other group groups that um, that uh, acknowledged their debt to the clergy consultation service were the National Abortion for Feder uh, the National Abortion Federation, Faith Aloud, All uh, Options, and the National Advocates, Advocates for uh, Pregnant Women. Nearly all the clergy consultation uh, pa participants that we talked to continued their, ad their advocacy. Many continued with the groups I just mentioned, but others uh, went on to work with in LGBTQ issues. Uh, Reverend Bre uh, Greg Dell in the Chicago area um, conducted a service of holy union for a same-sex couple in 1998 and was prosecuted by the, um, by the Methodist Church at that time for, for that. Uh, Howard Moody and Arlene Carmen established a program uh, to provide health care and other assistance to sex workers. And Moody later uh, took on the campaign to liberalize drug laws. Liz Canfield of the Los Angeles group uh, moved to uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico and established a free clinic there and um, services for people with AIDS. Uh, a member of the clergy of the Chicago Clergy Consultation Service, uh, Ron, Hammerly, uh, Ron Hammerly, founded a uh, group to advocate for medical assistance in dying. Um, many uh, clergy consultation service people also uh, just found that uh, count the counseling experience had been such a good experience for them, so positive and so satisfying that they became full-time counselors and therapists. Um, nearly all of the clergy that we talked to said they would uh, do it all over again if they needed to, and uh, it may need, may, may need to happen. Uh, as you're probably aware, in uh, recent years, uh, state laws on abortion have become more and more restrictive. Um, fewer women have access to abortion close by, uh, funding for uh, Planned Parenthood and, in fact, other health care in general is in jeopardy. And the uh, Supreme Court balance has already changed, putting the Roe versus Wade decision in danger of being overturned. Uh, if any of this concerns you, I must recommend this book, uh, Handbook for a, for a Post-Roe America by Robin Marty, which, um, which came out earlier this year. Uh, it's a resource. It's really a ha truly a handbook um, uh, for activists or for advocates, for people who want to keep abortion safe and accessible, uh, for healthcare providers, for mental health uh, providers, for women who want to um, offer help to those seeking abortions, and even for those who just want to know where would be the best place to offer um, to make a donation, for example. Uh, so it's a very practical guide, um, and I think Dean uh, of, um, uh, of Michigan News has some copies available, or if, she does, if she's out of copies, uh, you, can, you, can, you can order them from her. Um, in, and there, there is a, um, I believe there's a, an e-book uh, for the library here. Uh, let's see. Um, in 2017, uh, D.A. Dirks and I uh, participated in the 50th uh, anniversary 
uh, celebration for the CCS in New York. And at that time, there was some talk of uh, reforming the clergy consultation service on abortion. And there are, there is, there are groups of uh, supportive clergy here and in other uh, places around the country, um, so including in Kalamazoo, that are getting back together and, if needed, will, um, will, will spring into action. Uh, and one last, uh, one last uh, photo. Uh, this is one that I'm, I just am putting up because it just cheers me up. Uh, that's Howard Moody and her and his wife Lori um, in uh, Santa Barbara uh, in 2006. Uh, Howard died in uh, 2012. The uh, the original clergy consultation service uh, offers us a few lessons for today. Uh, first of all. Uh, they listened to uh, the experiences uh, of those and needs of those who actually were affected by the issues. Um, and they learned as they went along. They changed uh, as uh, to meet the needs for women as, uh, for women as, they, um, as, they, as they learned. And um, they developed from a referral service to a real consumer advocacy group to a clinic operator, hospital monitoring group, and political advocacy group. Second of all, the uh, group uh, was formed from people who had been activists on other issues, civil rights, peace, and poverty. It, was called, uh, it, it wasn't called intersectionality then, but of course that's what it was. That's what it was. Um, they saw that all those uh, things had bear a bearing on each other and on women's reproductive rights. In the 1990s, women of color joined, uh, coined the term reproductive justice to frame the way we need to bring together issues of reproductive rights and social justice. As the group Sister Song puts it, uh, we need to join together across issues and identities to ensure access to abortion and other reproductive health care, not just theoretical choice. And finally, the clergy were not afraid to take direct practical action. Uh, the era of the clergy consultation service predated the horrible um, abortion violence uh, that, that started happening in the, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but we but we asked most of the, our interviewees if they had been afraid of uh, arrest or of other, reper, um, of other repercussions. Some of them actually laughed out loud when we, <laughs> when we asked them that, uh, saying that they had been arrested before and that was the least of their, of their worries. They did what they needed to do to offer women practical compassion. So I thank all of you who do that on a daily basis and who will continue to do that. Uh, we may need to do that again. Uh, it was, um, it's, it's important work and uh, I appreciate it very much. So thank you all. And we're all check, set. Check questions? Sorry? Questions, yes, absolutely. Does anybody I'd have love, any questions? I'd love to answer questions. Questions, yeah. questions. Anyone, anyone. Okay, I want to give you the microphone. <laughs> Um, I was just curious, you mentioned a doctor that was like previously a like pro, an advocate. For yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what made him change so drastically? It's interesting. I'm not absolutely sure. I, I did read his, um, I did read his book uh, and he just, you know, he just was very, very one way and then, um, you know, kind of changed his changed radically but I don't know what the what the tipping point was for him it was do you do you remember what it was yeah, he was Jewish and he converted to Catholicism oh 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 and it was true that um, that at the time even um, even a pretty evangelical or um, you know um, uh, evangelical Protestants were not particularly fussed one way or another. They weren't, you know, pro 
choice particularly, but they didn't take it up as a as a um, as a as an issue. Uh, that didn't happen till later, until after uh, Roe v. Wade happened. Uh, up until that point, it was really uh, the not. It wasn't just even the um, uh, the cat cat run-of-the-mill Catholics, it was basically the, um, uh, the, the higher-up uh, um, Catholics that, uh, that were against abortion. Uh, most most run-of-the-mill uh, Catholics uh, were as pro-choice as, as any other denomination. What was most interesting or surprising about your research? Gosh, we were, I mean, we were surprised every single time. <laughs> I guess what was most surprising to me was how, um, how they gave their time. I mean, when they, uh, many of the, um, many of the, um, many of the people we talked to were spending hours upon hours on their weeks on call just um, seeing person after person, so many people, you know, just so many people. Uh, the, in fact, the uh, Los Angeles guy, uh, Hugh Annual, um, lost his job because he was spending 60 hours a week working on the clergy consultation service. And he finally set up his own, um, his own kind of uh, church organization that would just provide provide that, and he finally um, he finally became the head of the Los Angeles clergy council at uh, the Los Angeles um, Planned Parenthood. And they combined the clergy consultation service and um, uh, and Planned Parenthood, and it was a big it was a big uh, operation. So people s really spent their you know they were devoted to their their time and energy. Taking, uh, dealing with with women's problems, yeah, I think that was the most impressive thing. Hi, hi. Um, I was just wondering. This is a pretty broad question, but what do you think can be done to uplift or like bring to the forefront the black and brown bodies that are involved in this issue as well? Yes, and uh, it's. There are many more organizations now that serve, um, a, a, in particular, um, people of color, women of color, and uh, that has made it. Uh, that has really brought together uh, a lot of uh, more um, cooperation. A lot more of cooperation have been, been uh, between. Organiz different organizations. So yeah, that, to me, has been uh, very promising to me um, uh, for the future. Uh, if this happens, you know, if the um, if the group has to come back again, it's a bigger. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a it's a bigger. Um, uh, it's it's a bigger group that will be working together, uh, so that is that's very promising to me. So, yeah, that's I, I think that is that was a that was a problem at the time because it would didn't it was it was so many women there I mean there there men white men that were in that organization and that won't be the case anymore. Um, I'm just curious, was there a lot of issues with like um, domestic violence and sexual violence involved with this as well that they had to deal with? Or I absolutely. kind of assumed there would be, but. Yeah, absolutely there were. Um, and I think that is probably, um, that was surprising for a lot of the clergy that uh, dealt with women at the time. Um, many of the, um, the the clergy that we talked to would say, oh yes, quite often uh, men would come with a partner, and it was clearly their idea that they wanted a uh, 
they wanted to find an abortion for their, uh, for their partner. And they would insist on making sure that they spoke the w women and very young, even uh, young women, uh, young girls even, would speak with them very um, carefully alone with them and you know, talk to them in carefully so that they could find out you know, that uh, it was what they wanted and help them to uh, find, uh, make their own decision for themselves. Because it was quite often, um, you know, uh, it was quite often that a, like a father or somebody would come and make sure that the child would would get an abortion, and they would sit and uh, talk with the with the uh, child or woman, uh, so that they could they could help them with make their make their own decisions. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Two more questions. Yeah. yeah. So, in states like Texas, where there's I think very limited abortion access do does this group sort of spring into action to help women either gain access to those limited clinics or to find local practitioners who yes uh, I would I would definitely uh, recommend that um, that that uh, okay. book that I recommend the, that I talked about was uh, very helpful for that because it may na not be in every um, in every pl every place that it's a it's a um, it's a clergy group, uh, but there are groups in almost every uh, state that are hel helping women to travel if they need to to find. Uh, abortions where they, you know, they may need to travel to um, to to find a a safe um, uh, an abortion, but uh, it's it it's depends on the place. But yes, ec Texas is certainly one where uh, I think there's a number of groups. So um, for particular states, do look in that. Um, in that book, because it will tell you, you know, who will help those women try to find uh, places to uh, to get to get um, abortion. Yeah. You've said that the book is going to be made into a movie, possibly. Can you? Let yes. Know about that? Uh, thank you for asking that. Um, <laughs> uh, there, uh, it is. Um, it's been. Uh, it's been, uh, um, I, yes, optioned is the word, uh, has been optioned by, uh, to, as a, um, a film. Um, a, it will be a, you know, a fiction a feature, uh, fiction, a fiction uh, feature film. Um, and so we uh, have seen the, um, the original, uh, uh, the original um, script. <laughs> Sorry, I think I, I think I'm having a a, a little um, a little head head headache problem. So sorry about that. Um, yes, they, there is a uh, script. Uh, they're redoing the script right now uh, to make it um, make it more about. Um, uh, about the um, and now I'm not thinking of her eight, her uh, her name yet. Arlene yes, Arlene Carmen exactly. Uh, Arlene um, is one of the most interesting people. We're so sorry that she had died before we started working on that um, on that uh, book. But she was really an amazing woman who did so many things for uh, for women. So, the the script, the new script, is going to be um, very much about Arlene uh, more than more than the um, more than the ministers. So we'll see. I, you know, 
we may or may not, uh, we may not, or we may or may not get a uh, get an actual movie. But it, it's it's neat. I'm glad that they're they're thinking about that. It's it's about about the right time for it. Again, let's thank Pat for. Thank you so much. <laughs>